God bless you. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Thank you guys. That was awesome. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Let's be seated. Let's be seated. Actually, be standing if you haven't sat just yet. And um, I want us to make a declaration just very quickly. And then we're going to do some explaining later. Alrighty. You know, there is something about taking actions before explanations. Jesus says, blessed are those who believe without having even seen. They just allow the deepest part of them to respond to a heavenly call. And so we're going to do some explaining later. But for now, I just want you to say to yourself, lay your hand upon your heart or your head, whichever one you feel like doing, and say that I will not forget whose child I am. I will always remember that the Lord of all spirits, the creator of all things, the God of the heavens and the earth is my father. In Jesus' name, let us be seated. Praise the Lord. You know, one of the things that the Lord's been dealing with me concerning in recent times, and I just want us to once again appreciate these guys. I know it's a busy weekend for them. So many um, um, meetings to attend and all of that, uh, but you couldn't even tell. The A game was still brought in tonight. So we appreciate you guys very greatly. God bless you. Amen, amen, amen. All righty. And so, um, and um, I want to apologize to Emmanuel. I mean, to Josh, because I'm always calling him Emmanuel. I just did it again. <laughs> Don't worry. Have mercy. One of these days, I'm just going to be bang on, you know. But for me, I have an excuse. You know, my father's name is Emmanuel, and my son's name is Joshua. And so, if I get it mixed up, you know, that's why. Alrighty, so lately the Holy Spirit has been dealing with me greatly on the issue of being consistent in my recognition of God as a father. You see, because God is so God and is so great that if you are not intentional, you would always just want to refer to him as God the Almighty, which he is. He is God the Almighty. But when Jesus was teaching us, teaching his disciples how to pray, he didn't teach them to approach a mighty God just. Because quite often we think about God and think about how mighty he is because we have already succumbed to how big our problems are. You see, the reason why some of us want to approach God as the almighty God is because that is what reassures you that your problems are not too big. You, so you see, it's, it's very tricky, but let me explain it. You see, if I'm thinking about my problems or my situations and my challenges as being very huge, then I want to go to a God that is even bigger. And that is the reason why the notion of seeking God as the Almighty quite often stems out of fear rather than worship. You see, as tricky as that is, we cannot afford to continue to operate like that because the Bible says without faith it is impossible to please God. One of my favorite examples on this subject of approaching God fearfully or, or in fear is when people are traveling and they are on the plane or they're going on a long journey. They're like, oh, let us pray. But the same you left your house and went to Kroger that is half a mile away and you didn't pray because it's like it's only Kroger. And so the reason why you're not praying because you're going to Minnesota is because you're like, man, I'm going to be on that plane for all these hours. Oh, I need God. Oh, let me tell you something. You needed God to come downstairs from your little room to the kitchen. Some people have stumbled and fallen in their own home and become disabled. Some people have gone from one room in the house to the other whilst falling for the trap of Satan along the way. Do you know that sometimes you get up from your room just to go and get a snack and your spouse meets you along the way and makes a comment and then the enemy overpowers you and you start to be in the flesh and you start to complain, you start to yell, you start to scream just from going from one room to the other. But we don't think about needing God in those situations because those situations are little by our own assessment. 
But when you think that something is big, then you're looking for a big God. And the fact that God is almighty doesn't mean that it's going to be mighty on your behalf. The Bible says that the Lord is mighty on the behalf of those who trust in him. God is not mighty on everybody's behalf. Because he doesn't have to prove anything to anybody. Everybody that comes to a, into existence has a measure of consciousness that is a gift from God. Remember that when man was made from the dust of the earth, he was unconscious, he was inanimate. He was there just like a statue, even worse. Because most statues are actually standing, but he was there laying down. And God had to breathe into him the breath of life. And the Bible says man became a conscious being. He became a living soul. And so every part of you has already proven that God is mighty. And so he wants you, Jesus wants us to approach our heavenly father as a father. As someone who has chosen to be favorable to us. As someone who wants to raise us up to be like him. And I will show you a couple of scriptures here to buttress the point. Do you know that even the genealogy of Jesus Christ begins with the Lord's Prayer? And the moment you see that, then you begin to recognize that there is a reason or begin to recognize even more the significance of never losing sight of God as a heavenly father. Do you know that if God is only seen as a mighty God, we wouldn't even appreciate as much the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross. When you think about God as a mighty God who sent one of his messengers to come and die on the cross, you're like, well, he sent him, you take care of him. Case closed. You know, that's how a lot of Muslims see what happened on the cross. They, they, they see Jesus as just one of God's messengers that God kind of cares about a little bit more than the others. And because he's the almighty God, and so if he could have been born by, by you know, an immaculate conception, then what's, what's, the, what's the persecution? That's nothing. So people in a religious mindset or through a religious mindset of seemingly magnifying God, they diminish his love. Because you're like, man, he's just so mighty. He's just so mighty. He can take it. No, but if you think about him as a father looking at his only begotten son about to be slain, then you'll appreciate all of what he was going through. It was not just a nail-biting moment for God himself. David in Psalms 18 says that God was so angry, he covered himself in darkness because he was about to do something. More like he could have done anything at that particular point in time. You see, and someone is like, wow, Psalms 18. We thought Jesus died in the New Testament. Well, the reality of it is that most of the details that we have of what happened on the cross was actually revealed about a thousand years before through the life of David. In the course of the week, I had an opportunity to share with the leaders on a prayer call that we were on that when the Bible says that when Jesus was on the cross, the earth quaked. That's what you read in the Gospels, right? The Bible says that the earth quaked and darkness fell upon the earth. Because if that darkness hadn't fallen, then there's no way you could have had three days and three nights. I hope you all know that. You know that between Friday and Sunday, it's not three days and three nights. And people are like, oh, ooh, did God manufacture an extra day? What's going on in here? How many people have ever wondered where the three days and three nights would have come from? You know, because Jesus says that you are a wicked and a perverse generation. No sign will be given to you except for the sign of Jonah who was in the belly of the ground, who was in the belly of the fish for three days and three nights. He says, so shall the son of man be in the belly of the earth. Jesus was buried in the tomb. He was not in the belly of the earth. He was in the cave. Just, you could walk to it. You understand what I mean? And his body was not even there for three days and three nights because they laid him to rest at the end of the day. At the end of Friday, so how did you manufacture three days out of that experience? Because by the beginning of the week, he was what he was resurrected. That's why we have Resurrection Sunday. You understand what I mean? But when you look at what David said in Psalms 18, then you saw that God came in and his entrance created a night. That earth that was quaking was not just quaking because it was a coincidence. No, 
he was quaking because God decided to come to the earth in his glory. But then if he had revealed the fullness of that glory, the Bible says if the Lord unveils himself, who can stand? You know that no one sees God and lives. So David says in Psalms 118, he said when Jesus called out to him, David would refer to Jesus as the beloved, which was very clever, simply because his own name means the Lord's beloved. Right? David means the beloved of the Father. And so when Jesus was being baptized and the Father spoke from heaven and he says, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. The ones who knew that every prophecy of David about the beloved is about this man that John was baptizing. They immediately followed him because they were eager to see the full revelation of that which had been promised. You understand what I'm saying? And so when you look at all of what was going on, the heart of the father, David says, I called to you, but you seem to have forsaken me. What did Jesus do on the cross? He said, Elah, Elah, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Because Jesus did not immediately see the Father. When he called out initially, the Father was still in heaven. Because David told us in Psalms 118, he says, you heard my cry from your holy habitation. And then you rode on the back of the cherub who was carried by the wind of the Spirit. He was carried on the wings of the wind. That was literally what he said. In fact, because it's resurrection weekend, let us even read a little bit of that. I think it's, it's good for you to know that it is in your Bible too, so that you don't follow me home. So, David chapter 118, actually Psalms 118. Where did my Psalm go to? Alrighty, here it is. Not 118, I keep saying 118, it's just Psalms 18. Psalms 18. Now, one of the reasons why I shared it with the, um, with the leaders at the prayer meeting was, and I'm going to just tell you this very quickly, many of us, we are desirous of being certain things to the glory of God. Many of us want to prophesy. Many of us want to move in the gift of healing. Many of us, we want, to be, we want the heavens to open for us to hear, this is my beloved child in whom I'm well pleased. We desire these things but unbeknownst to us, quite often, is every one of those things comes at a price. There is a price to pay. When you look at how David prophesied, David would prophesy on occasion because his life was threatened to the point wherein he would faint and appear in heaven. David had several experiences wherein he literally was under so much pressure that he would literally be too it will be too much for him to bear and he will give up the ghost and then show up in heaven and have all these experiences and record it. You know, he recorded a lot of things that were straight up out of heaven. Remember when he said, what is man that you are mindful of him, the son of man that you would visit him? What he was saying was, he was speaking on behalf of the Elohim, on behalf of the mighty ones who called a meeting to actually inquire of God why God was so interested in man because as far as they were concerned, man was a failed project. So they came to God and they were like, God, we have a question. We are really concerned at this point because you keep investing in this project and it doesn't seem to be moving forward. They said, what is man that you are mindful of him, the son of man that you would visit him? And David was there and was like, uh-oh, they're talking about us. Every now and again, he heard the ancient ones refer to us as babes because we just came on the scene and they have been around since day one. And so David would have those experiences and sometimes we desire those experiences and we're like, oh my God, if I can just sing like that, if I can just have inspiration like that, be careful what you ask for because some of those things are not handed down here. You have to go up there to get it. And the journey up there is not always pretty. You know what they say, everybody wants to go home but no, go to heaven but nobody wants to die to get there. You understand what I mean? But let me tell you something, when you read the account of the people who went to heaven in the Bible, it was not as pleasurable as you would think. Many of them literally wanted to die again when they got to the presence of God. People like Isaiah, Isaiah was like, that's, I'm finished. That's what he said. As soon as he showed up in the presence of God, he was like, I am, I am undone. It's over. I don't even qualify to be here. Let all of these fire just consume me right now. Because it was too much for him as a person to handle, they had to send an angel to help him out. 
So when you look at David, David prophesied about Jesus because he was speaking about his own experiences. It wasn't until the end of this Psalms 118, I mean Psalms 18, goodness, why 118 today? I'm so, uh, well, maybe I think I know the reason why. But we'll save that for another day. When you look at what he said in Psalms 118, in Psalms 18, verse 50, he says, great deliverance he gives to his king and shows mercy to who? To his anointed. Do you know that if that was written in Greek, it would have said it, he shows mercy to his Christ. Because the word anointed, the word Christ means the anointed one. This man was straight up prophesying about Jesus. But to him, he thought he was speaking about himself because he was also anointed to be king. Now he went on to say that to David and his descendants, to who? To the beloved one and his descendants forevermore. And who are the descendants of the Lord Jesus? We are the co-heirs of salvation together with Christ Jesus. But when he was saying all of these things, he was saying it because he was anointed. He was saying it because he was a king. He was saying it because there was a promise of God that he was aware of where God is saying to him, you will not lack a man on the, tr on the throne. Your seed will be on the throne forever. He thought God was speaking about him. He was there like, well, God, you love me so much. And God was like, indeed, God was talking about the Christ. Are you with me? And so let me tell you something. One of the things that I have taken away from the experience of David and the life of David is that if I make myself available for God to use as he wills, I will have the experiences of the anointed one. Everything that God is doing in me, doing in you, and doing through you is simply revealing Christ, the hope of glory. So the reason why David went through the shadow, the valley of the shadow of death, was because Jesus was going to stand face to face with death. And that was why he said, oh, I am not afraid because you are with me. How did we know that God was with Jesus when he was in Hades? Because David already said it, that in the valley of the shadow of death, that Jesus was not alone. Because the Spirit of God was with him. Let me prove to you very quickly that the Holy Spirit was with Jesus. And we're going to move on. I'm just excited about this Psalm 18. It's just a beautiful piece. Let's start from, um, uh, where, where, where is a good place to start from? Okay, let's start from verse 4. Psalms 18, verse 4. He says, the pangs of death surround me, and the floods of ungodliness made me afraid. The sorrows of Sheol surrounded me. The snares of death confronted me. Is this familiar? This was the Garden of Gethsemane. The reason why Jesus was sweating blood was because death was lurking around him. Death surrounded him. He could smell Sheol from the Garden of Eden. And that was why he was like, uh, if this cup can pass over me, it wouldn't be a bad idea. Jesus said to the Father, he says, can we just kind of like make a change? Maybe we can just skip to Sunday. He didn't say he didn't want to die. He was just like, let's just skip. He says, let this cup pass over me. He says, but nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. This was what Jesus was going through. But in the Garden of Gethsemane, there was no, we, we thought maybe he was sweating blood because he felt alone because his disciples had gone to sleep. Sometimes when people are not with you, it's not as bad as when the wrong people are with you. You understand what I mean? Sometimes you're driving alone in your car and you're just feeling okay. But then you have someone in the car nagging you to hell or complaining, or just, you know? Yeah, those old friends. Let's, let's keep it, let's keep it safe. You know what I mean? So, yeah, let's keep doing it. Let's keep it to the book of Psalms today. You see, Jesus was not as concerned about his disciples. In fact, why did he ask them to watch with him a little? He wasn't as much for him, for himself, as much as it was for them. Because the moment he told Peter that he had prayed for Peter, he knew that Peter wasn't praying. And the moment that you're being prayed for, that doesn't mean you should stop praying. He should just let you know that you are not alone in intercession, that there is a witness and the power of agreement will see you through. Jesus says, whatsoever two or three of you shall agree concerning. But many of us, because our mothers are praying for us, we are not praying. 
I tell my children, I'm praying for you, but you need to learn how to pray. Because one will chase a thousand, but two will put 10,000 to flight. If your mom is praying for you and you're also praying, oh my goodness, you become a dangerous fellow. So Jesus says, oh Peter, I'm praying for you. And Peter was like, you got it? Good. And he was there, snoring his face off. He was sleeping the sleep of death. Anyway, the Bible says here in verse 6, he says, in my distress, I called upon the Lord and cried out to my God. When Jesus was distressed on the cross, after they gave him the vinegar, what did he do? He cried because he was greatly distressed. And he was used to seeing God in a particular form and he didn't see him. Because on that day, God wanted to be everywhere but at Golgotha. I mean, you don't want to be where some of your children are killing their older brother. That is the worst pain that anyone can ever experience. Because when the fallen angels, the watchers were reported to God, God was like, oh, I already have a sentence for them. He says their penalty will be that they will not die, but live to see their offspring destroy one another. And that's where we got the legend of the clash of the titans from. Because those demigods, half man, half God, they killed each other off the face of the earth in bloody battles. Remember that they were taught the art of war by their fallen angel fathers. You know, recently I was watching the video online and some people are celebrating now evidences of atomic and nuclear weapons that were used thousands of years ago on earth. I'm like, you guys are late to the game. We already knew that. The class of the Titans wasn't just fought with spears and arrows and swords. These battles were fought using all kinds of nuclear weapons because the guys who started the battle were from an ancient civilization called heaven. That is the reason why you have some places on earth that became deserts because of all the explosions that happened thousands of years ago. We look at those things today and you can literally see mountains melting because of fire. A scientist, about a couple of years ago, he went to a particular place that is believed to be Sodom and Gomorrah and he started digging around and he found an, I mean, a great amount of sulfur, which the Old Testament calls brimstone. Brimstone is also sulfur, right? Because when the Bible, come, when the angels were told to incinerate Sodom and Gomorrah, they were told to do it using brimstone because nothing burns like sulfur. And so you see that God knows the most painful thing and he made himself subject to the most painful thing because there is no higher sentence than self-destruction. It is a great sentence. And so here we are. We know that the father was not there at Golgotha. He was still in his presence. In, in, he, was, he was on his throne. He was in heaven. And so when Jesus said, my father, my father, on a day like this, I expect you to be here. He says, why have you forsaken me? And look at what the father did. The Bible says in verse 6, let's read again. In my distress, I called upon the Lord and cried out to my God. He heard my voice from his temple. How disappointing. From his temple. So you were in your temple and your boy is being killed. Wow. When I was healing the sick and raising the dead, you were right here. Showing off, saying, this is my beloved son. Look at my boy. He's knocking it out of the park. But when I was being killed, and that was because the father has a heart that could not celebrate at that moment. He could barely bear that moment. You see, one of the things that I would like for us to take away from here today is the recognition of the, of the heart of the Father. You see, because God would do things for you, not because he can, but he would do things for you just because he can't but do it for you. You know, there's a difference. You know, I can do things for you because I can afford to, right? But it is, my commitment because I can is not as intense as my commitment because I cannot but do it. Let me explain that the way Jesus explained it. Jesus says, can a woman forget her suckling child? He said, though they may, Yet I will not, because I cannot afford to watch you perish. I'm not saving you because I can. I'm saving you because I cannot afford to not save you. 
You know, there is a difference. There is a difference between somebody doing something just because they're being benevolent and somebody doing it because they have a commitment to you that is unwavering and unshaking. And that is how Jesus wants you and I to come to the Father in the Lord's Prayer. He says you begin by saying, Our Father, which art in heaven. He is your Father. Because he's your Father, he cannot let you go hungry. David said, I was young, but now I am old. I have never seen the righteous forsaken, nor his children begging for bread. The young lions do lack and suffer hunger. But the ones who are the Lord's, they will not lack anything good. Because God cannot afford to not be God. He cannot afford to not be good to you. So when you come to him by that level of faith, he recognizes you as his child. And so here is the deal. The father was listening from his temple. He was receiving that phone call that he had dreaded so much for all of eternity. Because Jesus was already slain. The Bible says, behold the Lamb of God that was slain before the foundations of the earth. And so when God was planting that garden east of Eden and trees were beginning to grow from the ground, his heart was beginning to beat fast because he knows one day his son will hang on one of them trees. All of that time, the father had been dreading this call and it came. And look at what David said. David said, my cry came before him even to his ears. Then the earth shook and trembled. The foundations of the hills also quaked and were shaken because he was angry. Folks, let this bless you. When you are struggling and sometimes you are angry because I'm in quoting scriptures, I've been praying, I've been fasting, and nothing is changing. How many people here have ever gotten angry because things aren't responding to your prayers? Yes, oh, come on, don't be, don't be all sanctimonious. We do get angry sometimes. Not just, come on, we're not just angry at the situation sometimes. If we would be honest, we're angry at God because we're like, God, I know you can do it. Why are you not doing it? The answer is very simple. God wants to help you move from expecting him to do things because he can. God, I know you can heal me, so why are you not doing it? God is like, I can do all things, but that doesn't mean I'm going to do it. I'm only going to do things that I have a covenant to do. I am committed by covenant to do certain things, and if we're not operating based on covenant, I am not about to waste my time. I've done that before with a couple of blokes, and it was all a waste of time. So I'm now only operating purely based on covenant. And so you say, oh, I'm, I'm angry. Guess who else is angry? God is angry. The Bible says that God was angry. And that was the reason why the earth quaked. Everywhere was trembling because of the anger of God. And this is what we read in the New Testament. The earth quaked and then darkness fell upon the earth. Where did the darkness come from? Because the sun didn't go away. Let me show you the darkness that created a day that was not there. <laughs> uh, let me tell you, that day was not there because the one who makes all days did not want to make a day wherein his heart would be that broken. But he had to bring that day out of eternity. You see, Jesus says, the son of man goes as has been written of him in the volume of the books. And he is the word of God. And when the word of God dies, then nothing is made. So there couldn't have been that day until the father came and made that day happen. And so you will see that day. So they already started Friday. And it was daytime. And the father brought darkness. And let me show you where the darkness came from and what the darkness is about. You already know where it came from, but let me show you the nature of the darkness. The Bible says here in verse 8, smoke went up from his nostrils. Remember what I told you guys? I said when I read that, the Holy Spirit said to me, he said that was the father doing a mic check. You know when you want to speak to a mic, you're like, mic one, mic check, mic check, mic check, check. Because you don't want to get to the start of the event and be slapping the mic, right? That's what unprepared people do. People who are prepared, they test. 
right? And so what did the father do? The father knew that he wasn't just going to show up to weep over his son. He knew that for there to be the desired outcome, he needed to take his resurrection power with him. Who is the resurrection power? The Holy Spirit. So the essence of resurrection is Jesus, but the power behind Jesus is the Holy Spirit. In John eleven twenty five, when Jesus got to where Lazarus was buried, the Bible says Jesus declared by faith, he says, I am the resurrection and the life. If any man be in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live again. He made that declaration and then he cried later. And so the father wanted to be very sure because there was only one chance to fulfill his promise. You know, David told us the promise that the father made to Jesus. He says, the Lord made a commitment not to leave my soul in Hades. He says, you are the one who would not leave my soul in Hades. Jesus didn't just go to the cross. He went to the cross because there was already an agreement and understanding that you're not going to leave me down there. It was prophesied 985 years or so before Jesus was born. And so David had prophesied that the father would not leave his soul in Hades, but there is no point showing up when you cannot bail somebody out of jail. So why are you going there? You know what Philip said when they said Lazarus was dead? He says, well, let's go and die with him. And Jesus was like, no, that's not what we do. I go to wake him up. You can go and die with him if you want, but I am going to wake him up. And so when the father left heaven, he had one mission, and that was to ensure that Jesus would rise again. And the resurrection power had to be present. So what did he do? He turned his face to the coals that were on the altar, and he breathed from his nostrils, and the coals became fire again. Do you know that physics? Can I explain that physics to y'all? Coal is what? Embers. When you have embers, they used to be fire, but they're now fire in the waiting. In order for coal to become fire again, what do you do? You fan the flame. And fanning the flame introduces oxygen once again to the coal. And it becomes fire because without that oxygen, there cannot be fire. And so when the father was going to resurrect Jesus from the dead, he tested the wind of life to see if it was going to do what it does. So the coals once again became fire from the blast of his nostrils. God does not gamble with your destiny. He checks everything thoroughly when coming to save you. You know, many of us would think that God is like us. That if he shows up, it might not work. When God shows up, it works. Because he shows up with tested and tried solutions. He could have just gotten up from his temple and says, oh, let's go and save Jesus. But that was his only begotten son. There was no trial. I know that he is God, but he has methods. And so what did he do? He brought his Holy Spirit with him. The Bible says from the blast of his nostrils, the same breath that gave life to the first Adam was about to give life once again to the second and final Adam. And God tested the fire. He tested the wind. The Bible says from the blast of his nostrils, what happened? The, the coals were kindled by it. To be kindled means to be aflamed again. And do you know what else can Turn the coals in your life to fire again. Praise. You know the first child that Tamar or Tamar, the first child that she had for Judah, what was it called? Okay, let me not get ahead of myself. We're going to get there in a minute. So let's finish this one and then we're going to go to Matthew. I want you to see the power of praise and how it connects to the power of resurrection. And so the father got up from his throne and the Bible says in verse 9 that he bowed the heavens. That means he tore open the firmament of the heavens and came down. Now listen to where it gets interesting. The Bible says he came down with darkness under his feet. He rode upon the cherub. Somebody asked this question about two Fridays ago. For those of you who have not been keeping, in, keeping up with Moses and Rosemary q and I want to encourage you every Friday, 6 p.m. to 7 p.m., we have an hour of q 
Q&A, wherein you can ask just about any question from scripture, about relationships. I mean, it's like an open ticket, but only a few people take advantage of it. Even not many people go to watch it afterwards, and I'm like, okay, well, it's out there. We are putting it out there. And someone asked a question and said, what is the difference between angels and cherubs, or the cherubim? So, um, the simple answer that I gave on the day was that even cherubs are also messengers or can be messengers. The word angel simply means one that is going forth with a message. The word angel is the word messenger. And so there are times wherein angels in the Bible were not cherub, they were not seraphim, they were not cherubim. Cherubim is the singular of cherub, okay? So they were not a plural. They were not cherubim, they were not seraphim, but they were just human beings. But the Bible records them as angels. Remember the example that I gave you a couple of weeks ago? That the person that gave John the revelation of Jesus Christ was actually not a heavenly being in terms of a cherub. The word cherub simply means a heavenly being. Beings on earth are called what? Beasts right? God made man and every beast of the field. So if you are not a man, what are you? A beast. So in heaven, if you are not, if you are not a man, what are you? A cherub. So cherub is every living thing that you have in heaven. They have a general description and they are called cherub. And that is the reason why the Bible says God rode upon a cherub. Some cherubs were described in the Bible or in scripture as lions with wings. Some of them as horses with horns, like a unicorn. And they can fly. On earth, they look like beasts, but because they're not earthly beasts, they are called cherub. Okay? So when you see that the Lord is riding a cherub, don't think that God is riding a, a humanoid, like an angel who has eyes and hands like you. Because that's going to be ridiculous, right? To imagine that God is riding another human being. It's like, no, he was riding a beast, but a heavenly beast called a cherub. In fact, there was a place in scripture wherein one of his favorite beasts to ride was described, and I think it's described as a lion with wings. But in any case, um, let's keep going. So the Lord was riding, oh, there was something else that I wanted to say about that. Um, just so that you understand the difference between all of these creatures that are above and beneath. The opening chapter of Revelation says that God gave a revelation to John the beloved of Jesus Christ. And he sent the revelation by the hand of an angel. When you go to the end of Revelations, I believe verse, I mean, chapter 22, 21 or 22, John was so in awe of this angel. John was so taken by this angel. This angel that can make them disappear and appear somewhere else. This angel that can open up scrolls and read things to him. And he got to the point where he was like, man, I have never seen this kind of power. The Bible says that he fell to his face to worship the angel. And the angel says, don't worship me. He says, don't do that. He said, because I am a man just like you. <laughs> I'm going to say this again because the last time I said it, I knew people didn't really get it. But I'm going to say it again. You see, because you cannot aspire to become that which you are not aware of. Because if you become what you're not aware of, you will think that you have lost yourself. That which is supposed to be a blessing will not be disasters. You understand what I mean? You see, if I don't know that God wants to elevate me in life, if I'm not aware of it, and it suddenly elevates me, I would think that that was the end of me, like, okay, now I'm just going to fall. How did I get here? So you need to become aware of it. So look at what the man said to John. The entire revelations, you keep hearing the angel of the Lord took him here, the angel of the Lord took him there. This angel of the Lord was a man. He said to him, I'm a man. He said, in fact, I'm a Jew. He says, I am of your brethren, the prophets. That was what he said. He said, I am a man just like you. Imagine if it was you, if you were John. This is what I imagine John doing. John, first of all, looked at himself. If this is a man, what is this? You understand what I mean? If this is a man just like me, then why am I here? How am I the way that I am? Why am I shrouded with such limitations? And this one isn't. He says, I am one of your brethren, the prophets. 
My theory, like I shared with you the other day, was that that was Daniel. Because pretty much the same revelation that was given to John had been given to Daniel. Daniel saw the rapture. He saw us being changed, receiving our new bodies. He saw the beasts of the earth. In fact, there was really no other person who saw the governments and the various kingdoms of the earth represented as beasts with horns and with various heads other than Daniel and John. And when Daniel was finishing his ministry in Daniel chapter 12, the angel of the Lord, which I believe was Gabriel, that revealed everything to him. Interestingly, people always in history refer to Gabriel as a man because the ones who have seen Gabriel saw him and they couldn't really fathom that he would be from heaven because he looked like them. Story for another day. But Daniel received the same revelation and Gabriel said to him, he says, close the book, seal it up. Because it's not for a while to come. Alan doesn't like this part of things. Because one day he said to me, he said, Baba, how come Daniel was told to seal the books for only 490 something years? And that was called a long time. Whereas when the book was handed to John, what did they tell to John? John was about to close it. They said, no, 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 keep it open because it's about to happen. So if what John saw was about to happen, that means it was less than 495 years. Y'all didn't hear that. Tia, you know many people think that all the things in Revelations are just happening now. No, no. A lot of what you see in Revelations, I would say about 90% of it already happened. I know it's, we don't want to hear that. But I will tell you why you should want to hear it. Jesus said when, he saw, when John saw Jesus... So you know what happened was, the Bible says that the angel of the Lord was given the message as a scroll. But this scroll was kind of like a digital scroll. The moment he opened the scroll to show John, the scroll came to life. It's like sending someone with a laptop or an iPad to go give a presentation. And the moment they switched it on, the projector beamed it on the screen because as soon as the scroll was open, John saw Jesus in his glory. And it fell to his face. And Jesus was like, well, we have only come to tell you the things that must take place shortly. And he kept saying shortly. So if 495 years was a long time, then why would 2,000 years be shortly? Think about it. And Jesus told John, he says, he told some people, he said, what's your problem? If I tell you that John will be alive when I come back, what is that to you? And we used to say, hmm, if John is still alive, he must be like 2,000 years old because Jesus hasn't come. Jesus has already come and gone. We are waiting for the second coming. Yes, I know. I hate to be the one breaking the news to you because when this revelation hit me, right? And you know that it's not something that I've always thought about or known. It was just about a few months ago. The Holy Spirit tapped me on the shoulder. He's breaking news. He tapped me on the shoulder one morning. I was in the business meeting with Nigeria. So I was already up like 5 a.m. looking at my computer screen. They were talking to me about money. But for some reason, the Holy Spirit felt like that was the right time to get my attention. He tapped me on the shoulder and he said to me, he says, from here, you're going to the new heavenly Jerusalem. I was like, Holy Spirit, it is I, the one who's been preaching the millennial reign. He said, I know, that's why I came. To rescue you. So that you can focus on what's in front of you. I'm like, what's in front of me? He says, look and behold, it was the new heavenly Jerusalem. And I'm like, so, but wait a minute. What about all those things? And he says, come with me. It took me on a journey. I couldn't even tell my wife. Because my wife, she's like, I'm a conspiracy theorist. And she's not always in the mood for it. So I called Alan, poor guy. I, I interrupted the business meeting after everybody was gone. It was just me and my brother. I said, do you know? And the moment I started telling my brother, he said, what you're saying has been one of my greatest fears in ministry. He says, because I've always wondered why do we keep bending time just so that we can accommodate prophecy to be in our own time, whereas it is all laid out in front of us. Please come back next week. Don't be discouraged. This is, a good, this is good news. I, I think it's good news, right? Yeah, that we are so close to the second coming. And that is the reason why in reality is the second coming. Because there was a coming that he came while John was still here. And that is the reason why of the 12 apostles, John was the only one that we do not have record of his death. Think about it. Philip was skinned alive. Peter was hung was crucified upside down. Every single one of them. Paul was beheaded. Every single one of them. The 13 apostles, the 12, 
plus Paul, making 13. And that is the reason why they keep telling us it's lucky number, that number 13 is a number of ill luck. Whereas number 13 is a number of grace in action. Because that was the apostle that was sent to the Gentiles who were saved by grace through faith. And that was why he had the number 13 written all over his ministry. But in any case, all of those things happened to them that Jesus said would happen to them. They all died. He said, as I am, so are you. When he was telling them, he says, the way they persecuted me, they will persecute you. So every single one of them was crucified. Every single one of them but John, the one Jesus said to, what if I say to you that he will be here when I return? And that was the reason why when the man could not die. Do you know that he was in prison for several years and he couldn't die? Every attempt to crucify him failed. So what did they do? They sent him to an island and just left him there because the guy had become such a beast to them. He was on the island of Patmos because they couldn't kill him. They killed everybody else, but John was unkillable. No, they couldn't. They tried. I mean, there were so many attempts made. And so when they noticed that there was something weird about him, they were so afraid of the man that they left him on an island, hoping that one day they would just hear that he died. Imagine their shock when they finally got there and they couldn't find his body. Ooh. But in any case, let me say this and I'm going to just move on quickly. I'm just so excited about this understanding that if all of that which happened that we thought was the work of an angel was a man just like Shayla. I mean, so just like you, because Shayla is not a man. But what I mean is a human being. You know, these days we have to make these things very clear. Yeah. You understand what I mean? And so, these things can be your testimonies as well. Every single one of us should aspire to be seen as an angel because we should be seen as messengers of God to everyone that we meet, everywhere that we go. You are a potential angel in the lives of the people around you because at any point in time, God can possess you to reveal the glory of Christ. We should aspire to live in such a way that people will be shocked to find out that you were born in Winder. So because you wind up in winder, that's why I chose that word. You see, can you see what I am saying? Because we think about ourselves as just ordinary men. Whereas Paul says, stop thinking like an ordinary man. He says, quit being mere men. Because you are not just a man. On some days you could be a flame of fire. On some days you could be a word from heaven. On some days you could be a trumpet of deliverance. On some days you could be a revelator of the mysteries of God. On some days you could be one that will carry others to places that they never thought they could get to. And you could do it within the twinkle of an eye because you have that same power. The man said to John, John, I am a man just like you. And so I want to get to the point where I will look at an angel and I'll say to them, you know, I'm an angel just like you. Yeah. So fly and I'll race you. Come on. God is good. Anyway, so all of that diversion, let's come back to this and then we'll go back to Matthew. So what did the Bible say? The Bible says that God was riding. He bowed the heavens. And where were we? He rode, verse 10. He rode upon a cherub and flew. He flew upon the wings of the wind. That means he was coming with the Holy Spirit being their buoyancy. He made darkness his secret place. His canopy around him was dark waters and thick clouds of the skies. From the brightness before him, his thick clouds passed with hailstone and coals of fire. Now that is the full details of the darkness that came. And then after the darkness, what happened? There was a brightness before him. So when you have the darkness and you have the light, what do you do? You have a day because the Bible says, so the evening and the morning were a day. And so that was the day of salvation. That day was the great day of the Lord that had been hidden in eternity, hidden from the workers of iniquity. The Bible says that Satan did not know that that day existed. The Bible says if he had known, he would not have slain the Lord of glory. And that's how we were able to have the fulfillment of the three days because it was the day that God came on a stealth mission, on a secret mission 
to save his only begotten son from the fangs of death. And that's why Apostle Paul records in Romans chapter 8 verse 11 that if the spirit of him that raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he will also quicken your mortal body. The good news about Resurrection Sunday is the fact that the way Jesus was raised from the dead is the way that you also shall be raised when the time comes. We carry the same power on our inside. We're just waiting for the time of the trumpet to blow for us to leave this mortal flesh behind and attain immortality. If Jesus experienced it, we will experience it. Psalms 18 that we just read, verse 50 says that this is the promise and the dealings of God to his beloved, to his anointed and the ones that will come after him forever and ever. So every time Jesus shows up, there is a resurrection. It doesn't matter if one had taken place before, another one is about to happen and this time around, I am not missing the bus. Praise the Lord. So God is good. We're going to just read Matthew chapter 1 and we're going to draw this curtain and pick it up again. On Saturday, on Tuesday, by the grace of God, I want you to come because I want to tell you the meaning of Shelah. I thought I would have time to get to it today. Shelah's name keeps coming up in today's message because I was already programmed to talk about Shelah today. The word Shelah means to make a petition. You know that when you find in the book of Psalms, the, the author of Psalms. So there were times where the things that were written in Psalms were not written by David. They were written by the scribes who listened to him. So they would write what he was saying and write his ad-libs and expressions as well. Right? And so they wrote the word that is spelled Selah. Right? People call the word Selah but there's no, there's no word Selah in Hebrew. Right? Is the word Shelah. So the fact that they spelt it as just the S without the H is the reason why people think it's different from the ones that are the S-H-E-L-A-H. Right? And so literally, even though we did not know the meaning for the most part of our Christian experience, a lot of Christian ministers still say Selah when they're preaching and they say it without even knowing it. Have you ever listened to somebody preaching one day and they get to the point and they were like, oh, Jesus was crucified, oh, this and that. And they say, oh, God, help me. When you preach to the point and you say, God, help me, you're literally saying Selah because Selah means God, help me. It is a plea for help. And so that is the reason why whenever David was in the spirit and he was preaching in the temple and he gets to the point and he says, God, help me they recorded it as Shelah because that was not part of his message. That was just an expression that came along with the teaching. Does it make sense? And so there is a reason why we need to know the meaning of Shelah, how to truly and adequately petition God. There are certain things that you do not just receive because you ask. You have to ask it by supplication. The Bible says pray with all manners of prayers. If one prayer is all you need, then I can, you can just choose intercession. Or you can just choose the prayer of thanksgiving. But the Bible says do not worry about anything. Philippians chapter 4 verse 6, the Bible says be careful for nothing, which means worry about nothing. But in all things by prayer and Shelah, by prayer and supplications, lest your request be made known unto God. Anybody who prays without supplication is like someone who is in the presence of God, just hopping on one leg. You cannot last on one leg. You need to have the leg of prayer and the leg of supplication and the hands of thanksgiving to receive all of what you need. Some of us have been praying and things haven't changed and God is like, yeah, because you have prayed, now we've made the tires but you need a seat, you need a chassis, you need a windshield, and those ones come only by supplication. So once you're ready, we'll be here waiting for you. Next. The Bible encourages us to pray with all manners of prayers. So we're gonna to get to that in a minute, but very quickly come with me to Matthew chapter one. Let's look at the genealogy of Jesus Christ. Now I'm gonna tell you something here very quickly, uh, because ideally, 
this is a teaching on its own. I think in order for us to fully grasp the totality of this Lord's Prayer and the genealogy of Jesus, we need to have a couple of sessions. But I'm going to say this very quickly just to get your mind prepared. So don't follow along, but don't worry too much about grasping it. Okay, I'm just going to say it very quickly. When the Bible says, in this manner you shall pray, Jesus was teaching his disciples how to pray. And he had already said to them that no one comes to the Father but by me. So if you will approach a heavenly Father, that means whatever mechanism or way by which you are approaching your father which is in heaven has to be a form of the Lord Jesus Christ. So the Lord's prayer itself was a description of the, Lord's, of the Lord Jesus Christ. So in order to understand the art of praying and praying effectively or the art of approaching the father and finding his graces and his mercy, you need to know the Lord Jesus. You need to understand the makeup of the men of Calvary. Otherwise, there is no way you can pray effectively. So what do we do? We learn how Jesus came here in the first place. Because if you begin from the genealogy of the Son of Man, then guess what's going to happen? You will have a more rounded understanding of who he is, and by so doing, you will understand the art of prayer more effectively and be guaranteed of always getting to the Father. Jesus never said no one comes to God, but by him, he says no one comes to the Father. So you can approach God as a creator, you can approach, approach God as a warrior. You can approach God as a problem solver. You can approach God as a provider. But to approach him as the father, you need Jesus. Because before Jesus was revealed, there were certain people who had a relationship with God as the Almighty. They had a relationship with him as a miracle worker, but they did not know him as a father. But I'm going to show you very quickly the people who actually caught a glimpse of God as a father. Who is the father of all the nations? No, Abraham is the father of many nations. The Bible says that God is the God of all flesh and the father of all spirits. There are no nations without living beings. So God is the father of all nations. And that was the reason why the only man or the very first man that we knew of that knew God to the point where when God was like, this one gets me, this one is a friend. You know who gets you the most? Your friends. That's why your spouse has to be your friend. Because if your spouse is not your friend, they will not get you, they will not get your nuances, and that's why y'all can frustrate each other completely. You understand what I mean? So a friend gets you the most because they're the closest to you. The Bible says a friend loves at all times. And there is a friend that sticks closer than a brother. If you and your spouse are friends, guess what's going to happen? You will not be yelling at each other because you don't yell at people close to you. You only yell to people who are far away. Even though I understand that there are still certain times that you will be far from each other in your understanding, you know, you may want a mahogany table. Your spouse may want a table that is made out of oak. And because she's in mahogany land and you're in oak land, you people are at Ikea yelling at each other, even though you're breathing each other's air. You understand what I mean? Because you only yell to people who are far away. Hey, Chris, can you hear me? But if Chris is close by, why am I yelling? We yell when we are separated by distance. And that distance sometimes is misunderstanding. You understand what I mean? Because you're not standing on the same ground. Someone is in the Himalayas. The other one is on Kilimanjaro. So they have to really yell. You understand what I mean? So let me tell you the secret of not having to yell to one another and at each other is to first of all understand the rudiments of friendship. You understand what I mean? And who is a friend? A friend is one that is called to be alongside. So the moment you find out you and your spouse are yelling at each other, that means you are at opposite ends of one another and there is a chasm between you and so what do you do? One of you has to come alongside the other and so if I want a mahogany table and my wife wants an oak table, as long as we are wanting those two things, there will be lots of yelling and she's going to look like the opposition and I'm going to look like the wall of Jericho who is not willing to move but so what do I do? I come alongside with my wife because once I come alongside with her and start talking about the beauty of the oak tree I come alongside and I say now I see why you like this oak tree in fact the one that I wanted is like this but this one is like that and you begin to describe from their perspective then guess what? You can be in their embrace and the yelling will stop 
You see what I just did there? The rudiments of friendship is to recognize fundamentally and geometrically what friendship is. Friendship is to be alongside with somebody. Opposition is to be on the other side of the table. Because when you're dealing with someone on the other side of the table, at best, you will be in negotiation. But if you're going to be in agreement, you have to be side by side. Learn to come alongside people. You understand what I mean? Because when you come alongside them and you begin to praise their perspective, okay, I'm already getting into Tuesday's message. You see, because praise is the cure to the chasm. When there is a chasm, praise can heal the gap. And so when there's a gap between you and God and you start to praise him, the gap closes. I'm going to share more with you on that on Tuesday. But, but let's keep going. So let's go to the genealogy of Jesus Christ very quickly. You see me, I'm just taking my time because my wife is not here. She's in the back, I know, but you know, before she gets here, I would have been done. Alrighty, so the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, this is Matthew chapter 1 verse 1. The book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham begot Isaac, Isaac begot Jacob, and Jacob begot Judah and his brothers. Alrighty, let's hold that thought for a moment. Let me show you the reason why Judah was mentioned after God the Father. And someone is like, God the Father? You just read Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Yeah, that is God the Father. Alrighty, you know he's three in one. <laughs> what is the Lord's Prayer, dear? Our Father in heaven, what follows it? Hallowed be thy name. Hold that thought. Let me show you something here. Let's go to Genesis chapter 38. Let me see if we can be quick about this one. Genesis 38. I just want to show you one thing here real quick. Okay, so Genesis chapter 38 verse 1. The Bible says that it came to pass at that time that Judah departed from his brothers and visited a certain Adulamite whose name was Hira. What happened to Judah? The Bible says that Judah departed from his brothers. Let me tell you something, folks. You need to learn how to separate your praise from your other interests. Judah's life with God did not begin until he separated himself from his brothers. Many of us, our praise is always mingled with our requests. Our praise is always mingled with our frustration. You say that you just want to spend an hour praising God, but you're busy complaining about how your children don't listen to you. You're busy begging God to give you more money so that you can buy more things. You, and you say that you are praising God. Your praise has to be separate from your other interest if you will run into Hiram. Let me tell you something. There is a progression to praise. When you start to understand the rudiments and the principles of effective praise, God will arrange for you to meet a man that is called Shua. Shua is a word that means abundance without measure. So the Hebrews, because they borrowed that word from another place, they just used that word to mean the word wealth, right? In my mother tongue, which is the Yoruba language, the word Shua was also borrowed. They've always had the word Shua. And you know what it means? It means wealth. It means abundance without measure. The same thing that it means to the Hebrews. So we know that this Shua of a person is an ancient indicator of the blessing of God. God will bring you into wealth. Everything that you're looking for after you have separated yourself from all of your other interests and let your praise be pure before the Lord. Do you know that certain people know what I'm talking about? And they will tell you sometimes that just go to God, don't ask for anything. Have you ever heard people preach up, say that? Don't ask for anything, just praise God. But we need to know it beyond a cliche. We need to understand exactly how to do it. So that was how Judah earned a distinction in the genealogy of Jesus Christ. 
So come back to Matthew and then you will see what happens. The moment the Bible talks about the Father, and I'm going to explain this in 30 seconds, hopefully. The Bible says this is the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. And verse 2 says, Abraham begot Isaac, Isaac begot Jacob, Jacob begot Judah. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is the name of the father. When, when God appeared to Moses in the, in the burning bush, what did Moses ask him? Moses says, who are you? He says, I am the I am. He said, okay, I, I, I get it somewhat. But who do I tell these people? Because this I am, the I am, I've never heard it before. Give me something that these people can relate with. If I say to them, these children of yours, how do I introduce you to them? He says, tell them, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The way the Heavenly Father introduces himself is he introduces himself as the father of many nations who has come to make you laugh all the time by giving you things that you did not work for. That is the meaning of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Abraham is the father of many nations. Isaac means laughter, effortless laughter. In particular, it means effortless laughter. And then Jacob means the one who reaps where he did not sow. Is that not you and I? Is that not what we enjoy? The grace of God. We reap where we did not sow. What did we sow? We sowed disobedience in sin and we're supposed to reap death. But Jesus came and allows for us to reap mercy. Are you not happy now that God doesn't just do things because he can? Because if God does things because he can, then he can, he can kill us. He can destroy us because he can. Jesus told his disciples, he says, don't be afraid of the one that can only kill or hurt the body. He says, but be afraid of the one that can kill the body and also destroy the soul in hell. God can, but the father won't. And that is the reason why you need to learn how to go to God as the father because he is enormous in his ability but he is also enormous in his love. I want to go to God as father because I want him to do things not just because he can. I want him to do things because he loves me. He is what? The God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. Regardless of what nation you're from, he's your father. Regardless of how sorrowful your life has been, he is the one to make all the difference and make you smile again. And he will do that by giving you things that you have not earned. Praise the Lord. <laughs> you know, I, I want to, maybe one of these days, I want to teach more on these three persons. So I owe you two teachings now on, on personalities. What's the first one? I want to teach you about three people that represent the righteousness of a believer. That is Job, Daniel, and who again? And Noah, right? Because those three, they carry such an attribute of God individually that collectively makes up the righteousness of the believer in Christ Jesus. And these are the three personalities, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, because when you study the life of Isaac, you begin to appreciate the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Oh, praise the Lord. You, 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 we will get there. But for now, Let's go on. The Bible says, and Judah, and begot Judah and his brothers. Judah begot who? Perez. Why was Judah mentioned after the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? Because Jesus taught them to pray, saying, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. The moment you have that understanding of God being your Father, you engage him with praise. Hallowed be your name. You don't engage the father with complaints. You don't engage the father by asking for daily bread. You don't engage the father by begging him not to lead you into temptation. You praise his name. Why is that? Because when you come before the Lord, you come by mercy. The Bible says, let us come boldly before the throne of grace where we obtain mercy and grace to help in time of need. Mercy would allow for you to appear in his presence, but praise is what will keep you sustained in his presence. Because the presence of God is very, or can be very volatile if you do not know how to keep it open. And that's why the Bible says God inhabits the praises of his people. God can show up in a, pray, in a place where he is not being praised, but he will not remain if he is not, if he is not praised. 
Can I say that again? God can show up anywhere. He's omnipresent. He can show up anywhere. He can appear in your room. But if you do not sustain that portal in praise, it goes just like that. Does it make sense? It goes what? Just like that. And that is the reason why some people experience God's presence and, and it's like, oh my God, the Lord was here and I knew it not. I felt like something was here just now. Oh, I felt this. I felt that. Yeah, he came. But you did not maintain that open portal. And so look at Judah. The Bible says, Judah, which is hallowed be thy name, begot Perez and Zira by Tamar. The good thing about these two names, which is I'm just going to touch on very quickly before we break bread and we're going to have a scripture again from the book of Isaiah to break bread today is this. I've been seeking the Lord concerning this fold here. I've been seeking the Lord concerning you and a couple of other people that listen to us online who stay in fellowship. And I said to God, I said, we have come to a place right now wherein we are united under the umbrella of the need for a breakthrough. The majority of us are seeking one breakthrough or the other. Amen. Majority of us are seeking to have the radiance of heaven in one way or the other. Whether it is in your business, whether it is over your children, whether it's just to have peace about the nation that you live in. Every single one of us, we're in a place right now where we can use a breakthrough and we can use the radiance of heaven. Because we want to rise, but we cannot rise if our light has not come. And for your light to come, the heavens have to be bold. The heavens have to be torn open. There needs to be a breach between what membrane keeps you away from the fullness of the light of God. And you know what brings that breach? Do you know what brings that bowing of the heavens? Do you know what creates that breakthrough? It is praise because the Bible says that Perez came from Judah. Judah means praise. Perez means breakthrough. And you know what? The moment you break through, the Bible says your light will shine. Zera means a shining light. Yeah. Yeah. That's what followed. That's what followed Paris. And, and, and on Tuesday, by the grace of God, I'm going to get into the, the, the association between having a breakthrough and rising. You see, the literal meaning of, Z, of Zira means to rise. A rising, like the rising of the sun. But because your light comes when you rise, what happens? You shine, right? And so here is the deal. Many of us, we are... Can I say, can I just take a minute to explain the frustration? When Perez and Zira, when they were born, what happened? Who came out first? Zira came out first. And that was why they tied a red cord, a crimson cord to his hand. But he was not the one that was born first. Perez was born first and that was why they gave him the name Perez because he was the one that broke through. Are you with me? Don't worry, this is foundational. Tuesday we're going to get into the meat of it. Because remember that Tamar had been trying to have children but every attempt was aborted by death. Things were dying in her life. Every man that she was with died. Remember her story. All of the sons of Judah, they died. And they were powerful men, men with prophetic names, but they just died. And that is how many of us are. A lot of things that we thought would bring us the fullness of God in our lives, they just die out. You started serving in the ministry and you believe in the call of God upon the life of, of the ministry and suddenly things just died. And you're like, oh my God, I thought this was the ministry. You get a job that you believe would allow you to fulfill your career and they sell the company and got rid of you and that just died. Tamar, I mean, I mean, what's her name? Tamar was in a situation like that wherein everyone that carried the seed to give her fruitfulness died. And so when she finally had this one called Perez, she says, you broke through and now I have broken through. That was why she gave him that name. But before the breakthrough, guess what happened? The second child stuck out his hand 
and to put a cord around it, to put a marker on it. Many of us, the reason why we're frustrated in life and angry at God is because heaven allows for you to see a glimpse of your rising. You see a glimpse of where God wants you to be. You catch a glimpse of it and suddenly it disappears. It, go back, it goes back in the womb and you're like, what happened? We saw the child just now. We saw the hand. I saw what the Lord is revealing to me, but where has it gone? Your rising is not going to happen until your breakthrough comes first. But you have already put a marker on it. It's on your vision board who you were going to be because the Lord has revealed it to you. The man of God came from out of town and he prophesied and that prophecy is the prophecy of your rising and you hold on to it with all the faith that is in your heart and after a while it seems like heaven turns its back on you and hell is let loose and that which you were even looking at with the hope of fulfillment disappears before your very face. And that is because heaven has a process for the fulfillment of destiny. And the process of heaven is God allows for you to catch a glimpse so that you can have hope. But then that hope is only there to sustain you until you have your breakthrough. Once you are broken through, it is over. So this is my charge to you and my encouragement to you today, folks, is that don't sit there being frustrated because you have not received that which you shall add, that which you petitioned of the Lord. Keep praising him because that praise is what will bring about your rising after having delivered your breakthrough. Let nothing in this life ever take your praise. It doesn't matter how disappointed you are in situations at people and sometimes at God. Do not stop praising him because because praise is the key to your prayers. Because if you do not learn to praise God with all manners of prayers, prayers that are void of interest, prayers that are void of frustration and doubt, prayers that are void of all things, which is called praise. Let me tell you something. There is no breakthrough. If there's anything, it is only a glimpse. If you haven't praised God and you see blessings in your life, don't settle. They are not the real deal. The real deal only comes after you have praised. So by the grace of God, I will pray over us today, even though we haven't got into the full details of how to activate our breakthrough. I've given you some glimpses of it, but I know that some of you cannot wait till Tuesday because that breakthrough is so long awaited. It is so long awaited and it seems like it's already been delayed. But I pray for you today that the Lord will put a song of praise in your mouth that will guarantee your breakthrough. I pray for you that in the mighty name of Jesus, praise the Lord. In fact, let's read Isaiah, Isaiah 14 so that we can confess this as we break bread. Isaiah 14, verse 7 and 12. Isaiah 14, verse 7 and 12. Look at what it says in verse 7. It says the whole, the whole earth, Isaiah 14 verse 7, is at rest and quiet. They break forth into singing. <laughs> the whole earth is at rest and they are quiet. And they what? Break forth into singing. Many of you, the reason why you cannot praise God is because your mind is not at rest. You know, what I'm telling you today is not the first time that you are hearing it. That praise is the key. That was why Jesus is called the Lion of the tribe of Judah. He shows up when there is praise to do battle on the behalf of those who love him. But you want to praise God, but why aren't you praising God? Because your mind is not at rest. You need a miracle before a miracle. You need a miracle of the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. You know what the man of God says? He says, you gave me beauty for ashes. How did you do that? He says, I know how you did it. By first of all, giving me a garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. Y'all didn't know that that was a progression? He says, you gave me beauty for ashes because you gave me a garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. If you can shed the, the, the spirit of heaviness and put on the garment of praise, your beauty cannot be denied. And so I want to pray for you today that supernaturally by the mercy of God, you will put off heaviness by going to rest in him. 
The Bible says the whole earth was at rest and that's when the singing came. When was the last time you broke forth into singing? Most of us have been breaking forth in sighing. You think and ponder about everything and like, and God is like, sighing is not going to do it. You will not see a miracle that came by sighing. Miracles come by singing. You need to rest. And what did God tell you two weeks ago? Even last week, actually, again, that you need to come into the ark. Because the ark is where the rest is. Noah is in the ark. Noah means rest. You need to be rested in God. And for you to be rested in God, what do you need? You need to know, Tia, that he is your heavenly father. If he's my heavenly father, then whatever I think is my problem is primarily his problem because he's responsible for me. You see what I mean? Now, the Holy Spirit said this to me in the car when I was coming here, and I'm going to just tell you. He wants me to tell you that you are taking too much on. God knows that you want to impress him because you don't want to appear as a lazy child that is not doing anything at all. And God says, what I want you to do is use what's already in your hand. Whatever is not in your hand just yet is in my hand. Okay? Because sometimes we're like, well, but if you tell me to rest in God, does that mean I don't pray? Does that mean I don't fast? Does that mean I don't confess? Does that, no, no, those things are already in your hand. The Bible is already in your hand, so read it. The words of God are already in your mouth, so pray. You understand what I mean? God has already given you the willpower to decide to say no to social media, say no to food, fast. All those things are already within your power. But whether that person will give you that contract or not is not in your hand. So don't worry about it. That one is in God's hands. And he will do that which is his to do. That is how to be at rest in him. I promised us that we're going to read, I said we're going to read verse 12. So let's just read verse 12. It's a mystery, but we're going to read it anyway. The Bible says in Isaiah chapter 14, verse 12, he says, how are you falling from heaven? O Lucifer, son of the morning. How are you cut down to the ground, you who weakened the nations? If you want to know the power of falling your enemies, of targeting them from wherever they are, it is by praise. So how did he fall? Because the earth went to rest, sent praises to God, and God sent victory down to earth. And so if you want all that deep-seated generational problem that y'all have been dealing with to fall down from where it's been, praises have to go up. So in Jesus' name, as we break bread today, I want to encourage you to do something. I want you to thank God for coming through for you with such a reminder word. You see, because Jesus came to show you and I the way. And so if we are going to make the most of his persecution, of his crucifixion, and his resurrection, then we must get to the Father. Because if Jesus came as the way and we're not still getting to the Father, then his coming is in vain. So you need to decide that you will go to the Father. Don't just go to God as a creator God. Even the birds that Jesus did not die for, they also sing to God as the creator. Anything that was created has access to God. Everything. The Bible lets us know that God has a conversation with all of what he has made. But not as a father, but as a God. And so if you will have a conversation with him as a father, then you need to appreciate the ministry of Jesus. And Jesus said, as often as you do this, which is to eat my body and drink my blood, he says, do it in remembrance of me. So today, as we partake of the Lord's body and drink of his blood in remembrance of him, let us call to remembrance the sacrifice that he made and the reason why he made it. He made that sacrifice so that we can go to God as a father and once we get to the father what do we do we'll cast all our cares upon him we we'll go to rest in him and by so doing lose every heaviness and bear and begin to sing praises to god uncompromised praise untainted praise glory be to god in the highest for his mercies endure forever 
you may eat of the Lord's body and drink of his blood in Jesus name. One more thing that we're going to pray about and this is on this will be a quick walk of righteousness but I know somebody needs it. As I was about to drop the cup I saw somebody raise their hand and a card was put in their hands. And when I looked at it, it's Matthew chapter 7, verse 14. And this is what it says. Matthew 7, 14 says, but because narrow is the gate and difficult is the way which leads to life. And there are a few who find it. For some of you who were not here at the beginning of the message, I spoke about the difficulties in the life of David and how the difficulties that he went through, the difficulties that he went through qualified him for the experiences of the anointed one. He uttered the same words that Jesus uttered on the cross. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He uttered the same words that Jesus uttered on the cross. Into your hand I commit my spirit. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for you are with me. Simply because he went through so much difficulty. And the Bible says that it happens to be so. That difficult is the way that leads to life. And the reason why you raised your hand is because you are saying, God, why can't I just have it easy? I mean, you said your burden is light and your yoke is easy. But why have I gone through so much difficulty? Almost every single time that I aspire to do better, to earn more, to be more. For the sake of those who love me so that I can cater to them better. Why do I have to face so much opposition? And the Lord is saying to you, it's just the way that I have designed it. Difficult and narrow is the way and only a few find it. And so the fact that you have found it means you should be thankful because that is the way to the fullness of what I have for you. So I pray for you today that you will receive the grace to quit complaining and the grace to start praising God. You know the meaning of the name Tamar. Tamar means a palm tree. A palm tree is a symbol of honor. A palm tree, every time his hands, the hands of the palm is always raised. Just like your palm should always be raised in praise to God. When you see a palm tree, its palms are always up. And that is how it becomes fruitful. I want to encourage you today, let your hand be up in surrender, in appreciation. Never complain again. Give thanks. Whenever you smell frustration, turn it into a fragrance of praise by saying, Lord, I have come to the end of myself, but I know that I haven't come to the end of you because you are more than enough. Turn it into praise. You know, I'm going to pray for you. I don't know what your name is, sis, but I want to pray for you today. Um, what's, your, what's your name, ma'am? Patricia. I was close. I nearly said precious. Can you please come forward? I want to pray for you. Because that card was put in your hands. And I hope you know that already. That the Lord is saying. It's been difficult. Because that is the mark. Of the kind of blessing that he has for you and yours. You understand what I mean? It's going to help a great deal. If the Lord takes the coal. By the hand of his angel from the altar to touch your tongue so that the next time the enemy wants you to complain, praise is what comes forth. The man Isaiah said before the Lord, he says, I am a man of unclean lips. I am undone. But guess what? His lips were cleansed by the coal from the altar. I want you to wave your card. Just, he was put in that hand, just wave it. And just say, Father, I well, thank you because now I know that you mean well for me. That your thought toward me are not of evil, but of good to give me a future and a hope. And as a sign to you, the Lord will do that which, you see, I see you praying for a young man interceding. Let me tell you something, as a sign to you, you will see great deliverance. And that will be a mark and a sign to you 
that going forward, it's not worth complaining about. It is always just worth a praise. It is worth a praise. Can you help this woman come closer? I want to pray for you today in the mighty name of Jesus. The helmet of salvation will not shift from your head, but will guide your thoughts in righteousness all the time. Be of good cheer, O daughter of Zion, because great is your God and loving is your Father. May you never forget that he is a father first to you in the mighty name of Jesus. Be cleansed in your conversations, in your thoughts, in the mighty name of Jesus. God bless you. A spirit of praise is coming upon you. You will praise the Lord in the morning. You will praise the Lord in the evening. And you will praise the Lord at noonday in the mighty name of Jesus. Praise the Lord. You see, what you have experienced, you Shayla, the, the arrow that was fired at you only graced you a little bit. Even the fact that you are here today, you've been shaken, but you've not been taken. You understand what I mean? You've been shaken, but you have not been taken. The Lord says, just stand your ground. No arrow of the enemy can get to you. Lose every fear of what man can do. The Bible says that the fear of man only brings a sneer. Let me tell you something, not even one strand of the hair on your head can anybody pull unless the Lord allows it. And he says, I forbid it. In the mighty name of Jesus. Father, in Jesus' name, I thank you for your faithfulness. It is already here. It's, you see, your blessing is already here. It's on the truck. That is how close it is. And the Lord says, and yet he bows his head. Tell him to cheer up because it's already here. You understand what I mean? It is already here. It is already here. It is already here. Let me tell you, I was telling Joshua the other day, my wife and I were like, we, we missed the smell of rain. And he was like, but when it's about to rain, it smells. And we're like, no, 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 no. What you smell in America is not the smell of rain. If you are in the tropics, you can smell the rain hours before it comes. You know what I'm talking about? Whenever we went out to play as children, we will smell the rain and start putting on our shoes. And some of us have to walk like 20, 30 minutes and we never get, not never, but typically we get home before it rains. Simply because there is a particular smell of the rain in the tropics that is not here. I was looking at Cody and that was what I saw. I saw you smelling the rain of God's providence in your life. Let me tell you something. God would allow for your faith and confidence in him to be renewed by a fragrance of his reign. And you may not see the material manifestation immediately, but your heart will still be confident in God. Don't worry, he is for you, he is not against you. And he wants you to experience. You see, sometimes God seems far away. You do a lot of things, and I'm speaking to you now specifically, just because in your head, you know that you should. You know you should pray, you know you should expect good things, but sometimes it doesn't feel as real and it's like you're just going through the motions. That is about to change for you. The Lord is allowing for you to experience the sweetness of his presence. God wants to be more real to you than you've ever experienced him. So just tell him every morning, Lord, have your way. Have your way with me. Have your way. Let us just stand up and bless God and just give him thanks. Wherever we're at, thank God for his fatherhood. Thank God for, thank Jesus for his brotherhood. And thank the Holy Spirit for his companionship. Just thank God because he's the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He is Jehovah, the man of war. God bless you. Hallelujah. Let's give God praise. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Shekiarama sotonde. Sintana ma ye derebo sokonda rama ye fasi. Ye na ma ise de moyas. Horri ma nwe sike dwere dere 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 dere. Sunday Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, Father, we give you praise. Uh, you 
you know, we're preparing for offering. And I want to encourage somebody in this. <laughs> you know, I wasn't necessarily expecting that word of encouragement. But <laughs> the word declares, seek ye first the kingdom. And all these things shall be added unto you. As I stood and watched the man of God minister to our brothers and sisters, I said, Lord, I see. This is how you've postured us. This is how you've been preparing us. Who else can I intercede for? Thinking of others. And in a millisecond, the word had come concerning me. I said, Lord, <laughs> I'm seeing this thing displayed. And it's why we have been so encouraged this season to go press in concerning somebody else. What do you have in your hand to be a blessing to someone else? Because God got you already covered. He got you already taken care of. Father, I give you praise. There's none like you. Ah, she came to. Let's give him faith tonight. Let's give him praise. <laughs> Let's give a sweet offering unto the Lord tonight. To our family online. There are several ways to give. And, uh, you know, <laughs> less um, after we give, let's take time to press into this presence that's here because it's different tonight. You see, as soon as the band had come up, I'm so thankful um, how the Lord has been using them. And um, I just was able to, to tap into that sweet presence of God that's here that presence of praise that we can take home. So I don't want us to move quickly after we give the offering. Just allow yourself time to soak it up and take it home with you. To our family online, several ways to give. Communion.house slash give. We also have the Church Center app, Cash App at Communion House, as well as PayPal. Thanks for putting that on the screen. And if you need an envelope, we have that here in the basket. To the left of me, your right. Hallelujah. Father, we give you praise. There's none like you. Lord, we thank you for this word. This time of fellowship with you, O oh God, reminding us that you indeed are our daddy. That you indeed are our father. Father, we give you praise. And we bring to remembrance, O oh God, in this weekend, the finished work of the cross, O oh God. Lord, your display of love. Lord, how you saw fit in your mercy, O oh God, to sit in one in our behalf, Lord. Lord, as we remember these things, as we come before you tonight, let these offerings, Lord, be pleasing in your sight. Let them be sweet smelling unto you. Father, we thank you for looking at each and every one of us, oh God, and reminding us how much you love us, oh God. We give all glory and honor belong to you and honor to you. And everyone said, amen. Hallelujah. You know, praise God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Alan. Whatever y'all played earlier, just play that again as we were saying, Amen. Amen. We say, Amen. Amen. Holy Ghost. Yeah, if you could just play that again as she went for it earlier, just as intense as it was. Amen. Lord, we say amen. Amen. Oh, Lord, we say amen. We say amen. 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 I'm going to just take a moment to pray for anybody that needs healing in their body. We have such a moment in here and I don't want us to miss it. So if you know that you need healing in your body, specifically an issue that has been present for a long time, I want you to just come here. Let your presence 
and your response in his presence bear witness on your behalf of your faith and confidence in God. I just want anyone who comes here, just come close so that I can reach you. Amen. Amen. Your prayers are answered, your sins are forgiven. In the mighty name of Jesus, your prayers and answer be it unto you according to your faith, your sins are forgiven. In the mighty name of Jesus, your prayers are answered, you are made whole, your sins are forgiven. In the mighty name of Jesus, hallelujah. Can you make sure that anyone that comes to help them come forward here? Your prayers are answered. You are made whole. You are set free. Your sins are forgiven. In the mighty name of Jesus. The Father said to the Son, You have been given the power. And the Son says to us, Whomever you forgive is forgiven. In the mighty name of Jesus. I pray for you in the mighty name of Jesus. Your strength is renewed. Your sins are forgiven. You are made whole in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Marabodo da senda le dari gala mama bara baba la dari gala mama shee sala dari gala bobo sala dari gala bobo sala dari gala ba. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, I wasn't done praying for you. I stopped the music because of you. I want you to come right back here. Praise the Lord. In the mighty name of Jesus, young man, I went in for you. Because of all the days, this is not even the day wherein you had any plans of being here. But the Lord already knew that this is the day that he had made especially for you. Yes, I'm going to tell you very quickly what I see concerning you. As soon as you came up here, I saw concerning you unspoken words. And the Father said, I have heard them, every single one of them. There are things that you haven't said to the Lord, but you have thought of in your heart. And the Lord says, I have heard them. Nobody else knows because you haven't spoken them. Some of them, you just thought, in fact, from the way that I see it, you have thoughts in your heart and you're like, man, I don't even think there's any point saying these things. I, I don't even think I believe enough to even say these things. But the Lord says he has heard every single one of them. And this is heaven's response to your petition, to your prayer, to your questions, to your doubts, to your struggles. The Lord issued a command that every agent of darkness that has surrounded you be replaced by an angel of light from this day forward in the mighty name of Jesus. Young man, today is the beginning of the rest of your life. You will not be the same again, not even if you tried. The Lord says, I have chosen to be merciful unto you. I want you to step forward by faith. Just step closer by faith. Just move forward. In the mighty name of Jesus, Father, I thank you. Let me tell you this. Anyone in the past who has had the ability to mislead you by knowing exactly your weak points, knowing exactly how to lure you to do what they want, will no longer be able to get to you because there are angels now watching out for you. Every single habit, every single thought, every single weakness that has been exploited by the agents of darkness will now be ministered to by the angels of God. You will find strength coming from within you. You will find resilience in your thoughts and you will find comfort in your soul because the Lord has chosen to come for you. All this while, he's been sending you messages of love. What I see makes my heart rejoice for you. And I want to say congratulations and welcome to a life of destiny, a life of fulfillment, a life of focus on the things that matter. No longer being distracted by the things that don't matter. Let me tell you something. Your creativity has been stifled. You know you are creative more than anyone has ever seen. And right now, even the things you write, 
the things you say and the things that come from your hands will attract blessings, will attract commendation, and they will do you good. God bless you in the mighty name of Jesus. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Father, we thank you. Amen. 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 Be glorified. The Lord says, let them glorify me in their hearts. And I will do even the unexpected. God bless you. Happy resurrection.